Hello, BookTube! <laughs> I'm here with my friend Sam, and we're going to do a bookish tag. <laughs> we do tags on BookTube. <laughs> it's a way for us to pretend that we like each other. <laughs> and this one is from the guys at Strip Cover Lit, Adrian and, and, uh, and Dalton. Uh, a while ago did something called the 52 Bookish Cues. Look how long this is. Well, some of them are very quick. Okay. Some of them are either or. Okay. <laughs> But are you ready for 52 bookish cues? I'm Sam is fairly bookish. As ready as I'm going to be. <laughs> Number one, what book are you reading right now? Ah, uh, okay. I'm reading a book, uh, a dystopian novel called Oval. Uh, by, I think, believe her name is Elvia Wilk. And it is a neoliberal dystopia, whatever that means, about uh, sort of ex corporate culture and uh, eco disaster. And it's pitched in a comic key. Is it a debut? I don't know. I don't remember. It's, de it's a debut to me. I think maybe... I think it probably is a debut. Uh, I assume it's forthcoming. Yes. Okay. Promising? Uh, yes. Promising. Perhaps he'll need a palate cleanser. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, question number two. What was the last thing that you highlighted? You don't highlight, though, do you? With an actual highlighter? With an actual highlighter. Do, do people use highlighters anymore? I think they do. <laughs> Some of them do. Students do. You have the heretical approach of you underline in pen. I use a pen. He writes in pen in his books. <laughs> Half the viewers have just gone, ooh. <laughs> All right, so he doesn't highlight. Uh, number three, what do you plan to read next? Uh, the next book I'm going to read is... Another, there's a theme here, uh, the books I'm reading this week are all kind of like uh, dystopia, apocalypse, futurist books, and the next one is called The Rationing, and it is... The Rationing! Yes, by it's Charles the pills Wheeler. on the cover. Yes. Oh, I think we saw that on this channel. It's a political satire, and that imagines that uh, there's a shortage of some sort of pharmaceutical drug that everybody is addicted to, and the government has to find some way to distributed in some capacity. It's written by a person who's an economist primarily, and this is his first novel. So I don't know. And you haven't dipped into it? No, I haven't begun it yet. I'll be curious to know. <laughs> I, uh, I read my advance copy, and I'd be curious to know. My, my main question going in was, does this author even know about the the novel Brave New World, <laughs> and and I have I don't know whether it's good or bad to say that when I finished it, that question was still unanswered. I was I finished it saying, okay, have you even heard of the novel Brave New World? Have you even heard of it? I'm not asking you anymore. Have you read it? Have you even heard of it? And I don't know, we'll see what we'll see what you say. Maybe you'll pick up on better things than I yeah, do. Yeah, I don't get the sense it has literary aspirations. But a political satire, I don't even not, I'm not even sure you want them to have literary. The last dystopian political satire that I read was the Mueller report, <laughs> so I'm in no position to comment. Uh, uh, let's see. All right. Uh, question number four: One fiction writer, living or dead, with whom you would like to grab a drink? Oh, goodness gracious! Um, living or dead? <laughs> or dead? Oh, yeah. oh, if you, if oh, you could bring oh, the dead oh, back oh. to life, We're bringing the dead back to life would be oh. Philip Roth for the dead. No. Perhaps Although we're living apparently... this Andrew Martin character? He's no, kind of... I know. I say, sounds like an unsavory sort. Good lord. <laughs> Your time is better spent. <laughs> I would like to have a drink with Willa Cather. Would you indeed? Yeah. I, I just... think it would be extremely pleasant. I just uh, <laughs> I just found and reread that collection of her letters yes. and loved it. Yes. The person who comes through in those letters has never come through to me in any biography of her. Huh, interesting. It just... I, I would almost second that. I think she'd drink us both under the table. But, but. I think she might, given where she's, where she's lived. Uh, question number five. One nonfiction writer with whom, living or dead, with whom you would like to share a drink? A nonfiction writer? Um, boy, that's interesting. My favorite nonfiction writers, people like Henry Adams and William James, I would not like to have a drink with. No. <laughs> um... What about... Um, you could sneak it in and say Vasily Grossman. As long as we're being drunk onto the table, we might as well, might as well be... <laughs> Alright, well, let's go with that, since it's fiction and nonfiction. Alright, next one's kind of tricky. One poet, living or dead, with whom you'd like to share a drink. But you don't want to be near poets. Um, 
they're troublesome folk. Yeah, well, I mean, I guess Byron just for the experience. <laughs> uh, and question number seven, I'm hoping the answer is self-evident. <laughs> One booktuber yeah. with whom you would like to share a drink, or perhaps many drinks. Whoa. <laughs> oh, what do you mean, well? <laughs> Like, have you been watching booktubers behind have, my back? I, 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 like, like everyone, I, of course, would, would want to, to be with Olive. Oh! <laughs> the drunk! Fida <laughs> oh, doesn't know what to say. <laughs> let's just move on. All right, some rapid fire. Okay, let's uh, go. Question number eight Emily Dickinson or Edgar Allan Poe? Uh, Dickinson. Uh, number nine Hemingway or Fitzgerald? Number 10, Jane Austen or Charles Dickens? Uh, Austen. Uh, number 11, Thomas Harris, or no, Sam Harris or Christopher Hitchens? Oh, uh, Hitchens. Uh, number 12, Stephen King or Michael Crichton? <sighs> Crichton. Uh, number 13, uh, Brett Easton Ellis or Czech Blahniak? Oh, good God. Um... Don't they both follow you on Twitter? <laughs> they can't be. You'll be offending either one of them if you do. <laughs> Can't be Chuck Palahniuk. I guess it has to be Brett Easton Ellis. Talk about stories. You yeah. could at least get good stories yeah. there. Yeah, uh, he, he wrote some interesting. Uh, no, fourteen. Kurt Vonnegut or John Green? What do they have to do with each other? Uh, Kurt Vonnegut. Don't get me started on what they have to do with each other. <laughs> uh, question number fifteen: Shakespeare's poems or his plays? Well, his plays. Uh, number sixteen. Oh. Right, number 16, you'll be sort of groping blind, but then again, we all are. Adrian Fort or Dalton Gentry? <laughs> the, the two hosts of ah, Strip Carmel. Ah, I see. You, well, you have to choose one of, the, one of the two. I think they're real names. They don't sound like real names, no. I know, but, but they are. <laughs> yes. No, uh, Adrian. I like the name of my son. Almost. There we go. Uh, question number 17, Cormac McCarthy or J.K. Rowling? Have you ever read J.K. Rowling? Have you ever read a Harry Potter novel? I know, actually. I didn't think so. <laughs> I've seen one of the movies, and I like to uh, infuriate Harry Potter fans by saying that I understand the entire franchise, because I saw I saw the last movie one time. I said, no, no, I get it. I understand what's going on. Uh, Cormac McCarthy. I infuriate the Harry Potter fans. I watched the last movie, and people were saying, wasn't that great? Wasn't that <laughs> epic? And I was saying, yes, uh, the uh, there were great moments to it. And they said, why are you hesitating? And I said, because at the end, Voldemort and Harry have an enormous sorceress battle without ever speaking a word of a spell. So can they blast energy out of their wands, or can't they? And if they can, then why haven't they done that? For, and it, Oh, my God. You don't want to see Potter fans when they're furious. They're not, they're not pleasant to see. I thought the romantic uh, sort of resolution was sweet. It reminded me of the, the last episode of Dawson's Creek. That's true, isn't it? They ended the same way. Well, plus you have Maggie Smith. Yes, in a great in a great moment, and she gets to return to uh, to the big screen with the Downton Abbey movie. Oh yeah, I have a screener, I have an electronic screener for the Downton did. Abbey movie. I saw it. It is wonderful, absolutely wonderful. It is impeccable. The only thing bad about it is that I think it's self consciously crafted to be a goodbye, in a way that the show never was. Oh. Uh, that I think, the King and Queen visit, on the eve of World War Two. Wow, uh -huh. and it, it's just. Just wonderful, just just fantastic. Uh, but we don't have time for wool gathering. We have we have hundreds more questions to go. Uh, number eighteen: Hannibal Lecter or Lord Voldemort? Yeah, well, I'm gonna go Hannibal Lecter. <laughs> I've actually read the books. Uh, number nineteen: T. C. Boyle or George Saunders? Uh, George Saunders, but T. C. Boyle is very good. And, and do you do you see different stages in Boyle? Yes, in I love his his early books. That sounds. I, I, Back with the Karagasin before yes. he went to TC for it really. Exactly. When it was T. Yeah, Karagasin, Karagasin, whatever the hell it was. Yes. T, uh, water music and Greasy Lake and that sort of stuff. Really? That's okay. great. I had a feeling he would, he would prefer a phase, one phase or another. Yes. Uh, okay, uh, question number 20. Good writing or good story? Good writing. As, as half the aspirant book writers in the world perk up their ears because they've got a, one of the major critics in the English language who has just said he prefers good writing to good story. <laughs> Duly noted. <laughs> they don't care what I prefer. You know what I prefer? <laughs> Honestly. Would it kill you? Would it kill Karen Russell to put a giant killer shark in one of her books? Would it kill her to do? She hasn't? 
Not so far, no. It'll be Twee, too. Yeah. It'll be a giant killer shark who likes tea. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, question number 21. Oh, question number 21 is not going to do. YA or kids lit? Uh, you perforce read some kids lit. I, probably kids lit, yeah. <laughs> uh, question number 22. Irony or humor? To the very limited extent that... that uh, writers in the 21st century distinguish between the two. Yeah, we're assuming both of them are good. I mean, humor done well is the best. You can't, can't beat that. When's the last time? Yeah. Humor done well is the best, I agree, but it's also tremendously hard to do. Well, when Mark Twain died, they haven't done it since then. <laughs> <laughs> He was good. What about a uh, case of exploding mangoes? No, that's that a had Twain-esque humor in it that I thought story. landed. Some no, 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 no. Uh, okay, uh, number 23. Uh, sci-fi or horror? You big genre fan, you. Yeah, probably, <laughs> oh, probably sci-fi. Mm -hmm. uh, question number 24. Fantasy or nonfiction? No idea why those are juxtaposed like that. <laughs> what are these Adrian and Dalton people thinking? Nonfiction. You have that, that is a question that BookTube has been asking for three years. <laughs> what are these people thinking? Uh, question number 25. Would you rather find a new favorite contemporary writer or a new favorite old-time great? Um, well, a new favorite contemporary writer would be more exciting because then you get to follow their career and discover the things that they that they get up to and you get to feel like you're on the ground floor of something exciting. So, yeah. And you get to call them curiously restorative for 170,000 people <laughs> who will all wonder on their Saturday morning, what does that mean? <laughs> luminous and lambent. Yes, and luminous. <laughs> All right, liminal. liminal. Let's not forget Ron Charles' bet noir, liminal. <laughs> it's okay. Uh, number 26, sonnet or haiku? Well, sonnet. Uh, number 27, I'm afraid, Sestina or Villanelle? You feel free to repeat what's wrong with these two. <laughs> None of us knows. <laughs> but nobody likes Sestina. It's a Villanelle. Uh, number 28, uh, uh, would you rather spend an evening at a library or a bookstore? I would rather spend an evening at a bookstore. <laughs> Your eyes are, are starry-eyed anyway because neither one of them features baby vomit. <laughs> so you win either way. <laughs> they don't let you in the libraries at the night. That's so funny. They, they, they kick you out if you have to go to bookstores. Uh, question number 29. Magazine or Wikipedia? Um, uh, magazine. Wikipedia. Uh, number 30. Uh, dictionary or encyclopedia? Um, that's a good question. Uh... Dictionary, preferably one with etymologies. Yes, you'd like that. Uh, quite, no, number thirty-one. Uh, uh, which writer would you like to write your biography? Living or dead? Living or dead, I presume. Um, God help me, I don't want anyone to write my biography, but um, uh, I would like you to write my biography. I know just what I would add. <laughs> <laughs> Precious little in the way of that. Uh, uh, let's see here. Uh, question number 32. We're, we're clicking along here. We're doing much faster than I did. Uh, I have a tendency in my booktube videos to digress. I know that will shock you. <laughs> I have a tendency to wool gather. Huh. I don't, it makes my tags very long. <laughs> so I'll, well, I'll be a, a perfectly straightforward question. I'll say, you know, I remember the time <laughs> I bumped into T.C. Boyle. We both wanted the same taxi. You know what I was reading at the time? A book about Queen Anne. You know what I hate about books about Queen Anne? <laughs> and, it just, and it just goes on. Well, he actually knows. <laughs> He's actually staring down the barrel of about 12 hours. Of one. <laughs> we have one long digression before us the whole evening. Yes. An uh, unwinding tangent. Uh, let's see here. Uh, question number 32. I do or do not highlight in my books. We said you don't. Uh, well, I question write in them. Right. 30, so 33 is I do or do not write in my uh, books. I you write in your books. Uh, question number 34. What is your earliest memory of a library? Of a library? That's a good question. It would be the, the Chevy Chase Library close to where I grew up, which is a very small place, and uh, I don't have a particularly strong memory of it, except I remember just the, the, the dimensions of, of the, the place and the little nooks where there, were, where there were chairs that you could sort of sit in the corner. The Chevy Chase Library must be fairly well endowed. Uh, it's a small a... one. I mean, I think in general the libraries in Montgomery County are well endowed, but this one was a, was a, a smallish one compared to the others for whatever reason. Uh, 
so I remember reading something. I remember being impressed by the stacks that you could roam and you could sort of get lost in. And I remember reading something on the little wooden chair in the corner with the windows there and sort of being hidden from people. Uh, and number 35 is connected. It's when's the last time you went to the library? I go all the time. I go to the NYPL. Oh, that's right. That's I, right. Yeah, too. I go to the main main branch of the New York Public Library, <laughs> and I, I work in the Rose Reading Room. Or now that it's warm, I sit outside in Bryant Park and uh, and read and drink coffee and sort of go back and forth between those two places. Oh, it's great. I felt so ashamed when I answered this, because I used to live in Bates Hall, and I don't anymore. Yeah. I don't anymore. You haven't been for a long time. Well, that, that and the Athenaeum. I used to live in those places, but... Uh, that was when I had two or three dogs who would keep each other company. Yeah. And so I didn't... Right now, though, why would I do that? When I have I have that couch, I have the lilac yeah. bush, I have Frida right here, I have an endless supply of work to do. What? I, I don't do it at all now. It feels terrible. Not yeah. to go to Bates Hall just feels terrible. Yeah, I need to get out. Uh, to, if I, if I, yeah, that's if just I it. stay that, home all day, it's not good That's the me. thing. I don't have that. Yeah, I don't. I absolutely don't have that. I don't need to get out. I, I've what it is now, or if I've never had it, but I don't need to do that, and that is what causes it. That's. Uh, let's see here. Anyway, uh, number thirty-six. Have you ever accidentally stolen a book from a library? From a library, I've definitely accidentally stolen books from bookstores that I've worked at. <laughs> me too. <laughs> me too. <laughs> you just feel shamefaced. Yeah. Well, libraries and bookstores for me, where you get to the end of the day, you're looking at your books and you realize, wait a minute, this doesn't belong to me. <laughs> I take stuff out of my shoulder. I've taken stuff out of my shoulder bag and you know, wait a second, the penny drops. Uh, libraries, I don't think so. Uh, let's see here. Question number 37, just a ballpark, how many books do you own? Um, I recently moved and put them all in boxes, so you would think that that would uh, help me sort of figure it out. But let's say I had, uh, uh, let's say my particular books, as opposed to just the books in our, in our apartment, mine, maybe 25 boxes. So let's say that there are 20 books a box, something like that. This is totally ballpark, and it's probably completely wrong, but maybe... So, what what is that? But you've sized up book collections that were boxed, right? Before? Yeah, but not not so much as other people's collections. I mean, yes, to... but not but never to like how many books are in it. Oh, we okay. didn't have to do that sort of math. Um, I don't know. Does that sound right? Maybe maybe there was about thirty boxes that were mine, and and probably sometimes more than twenty if it's some of them had mass markets. I don't know. I don't know what this is. This is like maybe. 500, 600, something like hmm. that. I would have thought more. I don't, don't have that don't, many. You don't I, have that many. Yeah, yeah I live in uh, you know small New York apartments. I get rid of a lot of stuff. I can't. I can't be keeping stuff. Uh, yeah, I'm thinking of I'm thinking of walls of books that I've seen of yours, and they're they're wonderful, but they're not huge. Yeah, it's not a huge collection. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and then number thirty eight. How many books do you think make a reasonable sized personal library? Yeah, uh, <laughs> I don't know. Everyone has a different uh, way to do it. I think. Um, depends on the space of your of where you live right don't you think i don't know i don't know you definitely don't some booktubers <laughs> you, you I... look at the background and all you see are books they... all my books are currently boxed i still haven't unboxed them and of course i realized you know i don't actually need... it's not like that's it's not like my I'm, question it's not like i'm dying without them how know? much do you use your books that, that's not one of these questions but i definitely have that question how much do you use your book i know every time i move and and go through this i sort of realize like well i don't need all this stuff it but then it's sort of sad to not to have very few. Uh, it's a, but in terms of use, there are two. There ever? Are, there are two, in terms of use. If you get a new novel by somebody and you want to reach out your hand and grab the you last know, novel, this sort of thing, the portable Malcolm Cowley, whatever you know, a book that kind of that you read for pleasure, but also doubles as a reference. You know, that helps you. That's that bookcase for me. Is yeah. That? That, that sort of stuff I do turn to and use, but just like novels that I've loved and wanted to keep. It's not like I'm going back and reading no. them all the time. I use them in the sense of when people come and say, can you give me a book I need to take? I'm taking the bus home. Do you have a book? And I, oh, I <laughs> but if, if for instance, Take anything. If, for instance, you got a new novel by somebody and you wanted to refresh your memory about yes. the last three novels, would that be something you'd do at the library? 
uh, if I have to, I do. I will sometimes keep something because I know that I'm going. There's going to be another book by that person, and I'll probably want to use it, or it matches some sort of vague theme or subject in my mind that I can imagine writing something about that I would want to sort of align them. But otherwise, a lot of it is just sort of like. These are books that I've kept that I think are good, so it's hard to get rid of books that you like and think are good, even though you don't really have any use for them. It's, I don't know. It's, it's a, a foremost reminder of mine. Having liked a book is not sufficient reason for keeping it. I know. But it's the most pitiful, It's the most pitiless thing of all I know. to say that. I know. But then from another perspective, is why do you, why do you keep anything if you don't keep it because you liked it? What is well, that? for me, it's the two things. It's the two bookcases of, of literary criticism. Right. So I get a new thing. Uh, there's a new edition of Julius Caesar or George Orwell or something like that. Now I all of a sudden know... Okay, what did Malcolm Cowley say about that? Right. What did What did uh, Dwight Garner say thirty years ago about that? Didn't Didn't John Updike have a really good line? What does Burgess have to say about that? Well, I will find myself standing at that bookcase just consulting it. Right. And same thing with with the Penguins, where I will just stand there and, and read for pleasure. Yes. But the rest of it, almost yes. not at all. Well, like you do for the Penguins, there has to be some aspect to keeping your books that is just about, like, these books, even if I don't refer, go back to them, they've given me pleasure, and so they, their existence is a reminder of that pleasure. Or help to make you who you are. Yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah, so there's some sense of self-definition. I mean, adults don't waltz into surgery and say, I don't need all these ribs, right? It's technically true. Right. You know, we're both trying to screw each other up. Well, I have a lot more books than you do, though. So, right. uh, uh uh, let's see here. Uh, question number 39. Uh, okay, this question number 39 is a little bit odd. Uh, remember that you, you, were, you probably have seen or were working in bookstores and saw that fad of Pride and Prejudice and Zombies. Yes. Uh, Android Karen and that yes, sort of thing. Did yes, you like yes. that when it was happening? Did you have any thoughts about it one way or another? That's the question. That's the question? <laughs> did, did I like it or was I against it? Um, I liked it fine. I didn't have... I, I, didn't, I wasn't tempted to read any of them, but uh, it seemed like... And this next one, I don't know. I don't know if it's gonna land. Uh, what is a horror trope that you would like to see more often? A horror trope that I would like to see more often. Do you uh, ever watch horror movies? No, I'm scared of horror movies. Are you indeed? Yeah, <laughs> I, don't like to I have an electronic screener for one that's coming up that I just watched called Ma. That is fantastic. Oh, it's just so creepy. Huh. It's about this group of teenagers that need uh, somebody to buy them liquor for a big party and they they stumble across this seemingly normal 30 something black woman in the parking lot of a liquor store she, they pick her at random and say would you be willing to do this and she says oh, I, I probably shouldn't and then she seems fairly nice she does it and then she says and by the way I've got a basement you people would be free to come there and, and have parties without anybody to bother you just one rule don't ever go upstairs and she insinuates herself into their lives and totally destroys them. It's so the third act would gross out a Cossack. Just gross out a Cossack. The thing she does to these kids when she has them completely helpless. <laughs> but, but you don't so you don't you don't know any horror tropes, wouldn't want to see any more of them no. than you already do. Right? No. No, it's a genre I don't. The the third act of Ma will unsettle you, even if you're a veteran of, of horror movies. <laughs> uh uh, question number 41. Something you think gets underutilized in science fiction. I don't read enough science fiction. I read not enough. I mean, what does get... That's, a, it's, I'm, that's actually a very good question. Shouldn't you answer that question? I forget how I did. Oh, you did answer that. this question. I did this tag, and I, I, was, I was up to like five hours by, the, by this point, so I don't, I don't know how I did. Uh, I think I answer it by saying that it isn't a question of over or underuse; it's a question of how you do it. Yeah, well, I, I could think. I could read a science fiction novel tomorrow about a chosen one who's from the peasantry who ends up having the fate of the galaxy hang on their on their life decisions. The oldest and wooliest cliches in the whole genre. And I could, if it was done well, I wouldn't care. <laughs> I don't think there are nearly enough Connecticut divorces. <laughs> <laughs> Near, not nearly enough upper middle class Connecticut divorce. <laughs> Uh, let's see here. We're, we're getting towards the end. Okay. Don't you worry. Uh, okay, question number 41, your thoughts on flash fiction. Flash fiction seems like an exercise to me, but not something that should be published. Not an actual genre. Not an actual thing. No. People who make their career off this stuff. No. Because it's not the same as haiku. Which is... No. 
No, it's not. It's not the same as haiku. <laughs> uh, although it's practitioners would say that it is. Right. In fact, that's the thing they, that they that they invoke the fastest is haiku. Uh, I don't see it myself. Uh, question number forty three: If you could own only one book from all of history, what would it be? <laughs> I think this is looking at collectible items. Oh, oh I see. This is like a one rare, particular uh, thing. Oh, but, I see. something you have quite a bit of experience with. Is there anything yes. that, that gets you covetous? Anything that, I any know. one particular item that... Yeah, the, um, the, the, the famous um, photography monograph by, uh, the, by uh, uh, Cartier-Bresson called The Decisive Moment, the one with the Matisse did the, the, the cover, but it's just, it's just a huge folio-sized book of his photographs. Um, I can't remember when it was published, um, but it's very collectible and he's the pictures are beautiful and it's beautifully packaged sounds French he's French yeah huh. he was French any muscular teenagers in the book <laughs> no no okay let's move on <laughs> uh, question number 44 audiobooks same as reading thoughts uh, don't matter you don't ever use audiobooks I do don't you? ever use audiobooks I, I, I think use... I would not be able to pay attention I honestly think it would not work at all for me and I would get nothing out of it if I were driving long distances I can sort of see although when I used to drive long distances I still didn't do it then either so I I, I once uh, drove long distances and I decided to listen to a lecture series and I completely different thing but I yeah, had to it's... stop because it was putting me to sleep while I was driving. Really? Oh my! I had to stop, take a nap in a rest stop, and then put on you know '80s rock. I don't know station. how people read or listen to audiobooks of fiction. It seems to me that an audiobook of fiction, you are turning over a large amount of your work to someone else. Right. Because you can't read a novel without interpreting it. You can't read it out loud without interpreting it. Right. And that's part of your job. Oh baby, we've talked about the biting. She bites savagely. <laughs> Those of you who've been visiting here will know that. <laughs> She's, she'll grow out of it. <laughs> uh, question number 45. The most literary songwriter of your lifetime. Most literary songwriter. Oh. Oh. Uh, Joni Mitchell. <laughs> oh, that's a fantastic choice. Oh, my. I said Noel Coward, but my lifetime is a little bit longer than yours. <laughs> He's great. But Joni Mitchell is another. That is a fantastic choice. If I had been limited to modern times, I would pick that as well. I would second that in a heartbeat. Uh, uh, question number 46. What writer are you embarrassed that you haven't read? There are many. Um... And you, you can pick a, a specific book as well here if you want, instead of just a whole writer. Right. Or is there a whole writer who you, you haven't read anything and that embarrasses you? Have you read any Balzac? You have, right? uh, but, but I've read one one book of Balzac, and it's a completely random one, so it hardly even counts. So, uh, but you know who I'm? I've read some, but 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 relative to how much and and how important it is, is Henry James. I've read I've read some of the short. I've read uh, Washington Square, but the Bostonians. I've read the Turn of the Screw, and maybe and uh, one other short one. Um, but like the the big ones, the portrait of uh, oh my yeah yeah I haven't read them in that not the one. golden ball I never read the golden <laughs> ball every time I think about the golden ball I think about Lenny Briscoe from Law and Order saying yeah I spent a year there one weekend <laughs> he's talking about the country because for Lenny Briscoe anything far away from the horse race tracks is horrible <laughs> but when he says I spent a year there one weekend I always think about late Henry James. <laughs> uh, Okay, well, the next one is, is uh, sort of similar. Which writer are you embarrassed that you've read too much? <laughs> Should you be embarrassed that you've read too much of someone? Yeah, uh, everybody on Booktube has had problems with that. They, huh. they're, but they're, 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 nevertheless, there could be somebody where you've, you've been excessive. <laughs> you don't read a lot of garbage. Well, I read a lot of garbage. Well, so one, <laughs> one person who came up here earlier is Michael Crichton, and I was at one point a Michael Crichton completist. I just oh, read wow. all of them. Really? Like the one that was about abortion and the one that was about... Uh, train robbery and like the the very early ones oh my before he was even famous before the andromeda strain yeah yeah there, there was a couple summers did you stop or did you keep going until he until he croaked i didn't read the last ones when he became reactionary and and 
and uh, became like a climate denial. The climate system. denial book has, yeah. if if any, if there were a hell and you could earn your way there by a book, then that would be one of them. That would be a way to do it. Because who knows how many hundreds of thousands of people he influenced who wouldn't have paid any attention to the news or science. But who will say, well, if, if this guy, if I love his books, and if he says this is all bunkum, then... <sighs> uh, anyway, uh, question number 47. Which writer... Or no, we did that already. Question number 48. What's a biography that you're looking forward to reading? Very, very optimistic on Dalton and Adrian's part <laughs> yeah. to think that anybody's looking forward to two biographies. Um, well, that's a good question. Uh, thousand page biography of Hitler coming out I know I saw that <laughs> well I think the I, I'm, I don't think I will read it because I don't have time but I think the the, uh, the Walter Isaacson Edison biography would be Edmund Morris Edmund Morris right. Edison biography what yes. about the Susan Sontag book oh yeah you're right you're completely right I that was fantastic love to read that. Yep. just fantastic Oh yeah, he's been working on that for a while, and it was, and it that was that was author. This is authorized. I mean, this is uh, yeah. So he got he got the real information. I mean, he wasn't sort of trying to work around. Uh, yeah, he wasn't trying to work around any censors. David Reef or anything like but, that. He he was working with them and working. But the with them. the neat thing that I, the impression I got when I was reading the book, you know, when authorized biography, you're always worried that the authorized biographer is going to be sternly warned to avoid dishing dirt. Uh huh. But. Sontag did that better than anybody. She could protect her own self. She doesn't need a biographer to do it. Right. I I got the strong impression that he was just told, "You go 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 ahead, write whatever book you want." I know that's the thing that authorized biographers always say, well, but you don't always believe he's it. He's a pretty serious writer. He probably said his terms. He probably was was. Plus, Britta says he's a cutie. Benjamin Moser. Yeah, he says he's a cutie pie. <laughs> that's a, that's a uh, uh, let's see here. Uh, is that anything you would ever think about reviewing? Possibly, but that, then I would have to... You'd have to bone up on Sontag. Really not exactly a... Sontag. That's not exactly a, a burden. <laughs> I, no. I, I've never read anything by her that I didn't like, even when I didn't agree with it. Right. I, right. Uh, yeah, that's true. Uh, let's see here. Question number 49. Do you have a dream reading cubby? And in this case, like you, one that you, doesn't you, exist that I'm just imagining, or it? that, or that does exist. Ah, oh, that does exist. And here again, once again, you want to extend your dream quality beyond an absence of baby vomit. Yeah. <laughs> That's setting your sights really low. That's only temporary. Right. What? What about an absolute? Not where? Yeah, where I could just if I could have a dream cubby where I get to sleep longer than twenty consecutive minutes. <laughs> Let's set your sights a little higher than that. What would it contain, even if it doesn't exist? Well, there's a there's a, a place that I. I can an actual place I can think of that you've been to. There's a porch in Cape Cod that I've spent a lot, a lot, a lot of time. And it's an old couch that I think it's possible my grandfather even may have constructed the couch, but it's got sort of newish cushions and it's uh, and there's it's surrounded by pine trees that are that are filled with, with and visited by birds all the time. It's completely filtered sunlight. Yeah. So you, you get the exactly. warmth of the sunlight, but without any of the harshness. It's a green space. Exactly. Sort of what it must be, one thing I've never experienced, I've never experienced that porch in a light rainfall, in a Cape rainfall. How uh, beautiful yeah. that must be. Extremely oh, beautiful. My. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, you do have a dream cup. Yeah. Absolutely. Oh, my. I forgot about that. Uh, uh, question number 50. What's the last literary phenomenon that really bugged you, that really got your gears grinding? Oh, wow. That's a good question. My pick was autofiction. Obviously, uh, <laughs> it drives me nuts. Since it's not fiction, right? If, if every part of it can be attested by Facebook, <laughs> then you didn't actually write any fiction. So don't call it fiction. Right. Take a chance. You know, take a risk. If you're going to do that, if you're going to be lazy enough or solipsistic enough to do that, then take a risk by calling it nonfiction. Yes, most nonfiction doesn't sell as well as fiction, but Trevor Noah's book did. So it could happen. <laughs> right. <laughs> but instead, it's proudly said. The, the fall catalogs are proudly calling things autofiction. Proudly saying the author has daringly revisited this rough breakup in her new novel. <laughs> okay, but if I go to Facebook and Twitter, I can see every single detail, even the dialogue. <laughs> Already attested to from two years ago. So what's the novel part? <sighs> but autofiction may not be your choice. It's just, I've ranted about it yet again, but it might, you, might, you might have something else that bothers you. There are probably lots of things that bother me. Um, but, let's see. I don't... Wasn't your bait noir for a while the sameness of workshop fiction? Well, yes. 
But is that a phenomenon, or is that just uh, I think it's a permanent quo, feature of the right landscape. Now. Yeah, I, I don't think it's if a phenomenon means something that may go away. Yeah, I don't think that's gonna go away. No, no. Uh, I'm going to anticipate a phenomenon that I'm worried about, which is the intrusion from from a very specific sort of fantasy genre, the sprawling fantasy series. I'm almost certain is going to work its way into sort of the mainstream literary world and it's going to take on attributes of workshop fiction and literary fiction and it's going to we're going to get these sort of game of thrones like things that are really not about the story of king making are really about all sorts of other more literary concerns but they're going to be really big and long and sprawling and have magic and dragons and, and why that sort of thing. Because there's commercial, there's money in them, Dar Hills, you could get a, an HBO deal? Because that's what people, because uh, that is what, because that's what people know, that's, that's, what, that's what people consume um, in their reading and in their, in their oh, TV watching Oh, the, the right long-form, open-ended thing. Yeah, They're, that's so central to the idea of, of entertainment and of how you spend your time. God, that would be horrible if he's straight. If that's true, if that actually does happen, that would be horrible. Of course, one of the things that will have encouraged it to happen will have been a whole bunch of high-profile critics praising Karl over Nausgaard for blazing the trail. <laughs> Perhaps some of those will be feeling a little regret for not seeing that for the three-card Monty sham that it was from the beginning. <laughs> no names, mind you. <laughs> somewhere, somewhere out there in the in the in the in the hinterlands, this Andrew Martin person is feeling a twinge. Oh, come on, he, he's brilliant. Oh, come on. <laughs> it's, it's gonna happen. More and more books. Every season, there's gonna be a book that you have to preface by saying the first of a planned tetralogy. Oh God. The first of a planned, you know, octology. <laughs> or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. Question number fifty-one. What was the last piece of literature that changed the way you read? Here I'll 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 mention a, just a very a book that I just read very very recently that I loved. I'm not entirely sure it changed the way I read I read, but but I loved it and I thought differently, or I it made me think uh, anew about the genre, which is a book of nature writing, a book of um, essays set in the Southwest desert by Bruce Berger called The Desert Harvest. And we this saw is, the advanced copy of that here, but you really liked it. Uh, I loved it. Yeah, yeah. It's a selection from 30 years of his writing, so it's kind of like a greatest hits sort of thing. And some of them are very short, like a page. Some of them are 30 pages, much more journalistic. Some of them are purely sort of free form. But they're so well crafted, and the, the point is that he has matched his writing style, sort of the, the, the starkness and the exactitude of it, to the setting that he's talking about is clearly a conscious attempt to make the writing fit the subject, which is one of the things I love, I appreciate most mm. in the work of art. I haven't read it. I've had that advanced copy here, and I oh, haven't. I haven't read it, and I'm not, I'm, I'm obviously going to <laughs> because I I take your recommendation seriously. But that's amazing. Uh, Okay, uh, and then question number 52. We're almost at the end. I added a few bonus questions myself, but we are at question number 52. Uh, what booktuber have you been watching most recently? <laughs> uh, you have a plug for your precious olive? <laughs> What's she got that I haven't got? <laughs> Other than clear skin, nice hair, and professional editing. <laughs> there are two guys, and, oh. <laughs> and Adrian and Dalton. I hadn't heard of them before, but I discovered them recently. <laughs> Remarkable fellows. Go on a little bit long. But, uh... There's one thing. Maybe if you they... don't watch their channel, there's one thing you have to see. They did a read-along of Cormac McCarthy's The Road, uh, and I did it too. I did three videos. They broke the book up into parts, and then when they were done, they did a separate video reviewing the whole book, and I did one too, and, and sent it to them, and they put it in their own video. <laughs> I made no friends with that. I was It was so much fun to just take Cormac McCarthy's The Road and week by week just drag it behind a, a semi-truck. It was just awesome. And what little bit was left at the end, I then reviewed and called it a total failure. On a scale of 1 to 10, I rated it as neg negative 11,000. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, that was a lot. Oh, the baby bee. Oh, 
she is the most popular person on BookTube. <laughs> uh, they cared about you until she showed up. Now they don't care about you. One of us. Uh, and uh, so, bonus questions. Uh, I thought of two. How often do you buy books? Uh, uh, I I go. I I volunteer at a at a used bookstore called Housing Works Bookstore, which is a charity bookshop in New York City. Um, that if you're there, you should go to. And it's quite the store. Yeah, it's great. It's not a huge selection, but everything there is donated, so it's very esoteric and very. Um, it's a fun place to just let chance decide. What but are you, you saying buy. that when you when you do a shift there, you buy something? Not always, but often. Yeah, really? Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, wow. Well, it's like four dollars, and I have, a, I get a, I get a volunteer discount, and so I go to, you know, fiction section or the literary criticism section. Just I guess to see at, what's at your there. housing works, you never know what you're going to see there. Exactly. Right? Exactly. Yeah. And uh, my bonus question number two: How often do you discard books? Did you discard a lot of books before you box them up? Moves. Yes. Moves always make book discarders. <laughs> huge amounts. Huge really? amounts. Probably. Six or seven boxes worth wow. of books. Yeah. Do you do it amounts. regularly under normal circumstances? Under normal circumstances, I get rid of the books that I bring in for work. I, oh, I get okay. So there's of, very little accumulation. Yeah, very there. little. Boy, I really ought to do that. <laughs> I really ought to do that myself. Oh, uh, well, there you go. That is the 52 Bookish Cues tag. I'm going to lie down. Practically an honorary booktuber. <laughs> <laughs> so wasn't that fun? Huh? You got to opinionize a whole bunch of things. It's I the did. only time tonight you're going to get a word in edgewise. Yes. <laughs> yes. All the rest of the opinionizing will be handled by experts. Thank you very much. <laughs> well, all right, we're going to wrap this up. If we get a lot of mail, we'll be back. <laughs> Otherwise, I'll see you soon. <laughs> Thank you, Book <Mark> Two. <laughs>